Okay, so my goal for the next couple of lectures is to say a little bit about uh, the relationship between uh, birational geometry and arithmetic geometry. So the idea is that in arithmetic geometry, subject where we use techniques from algebraic geometry to solve number theory problems. Well, what do I mean by that? So in number theory, you know, in number theory, you're interested in solutions to equations over the integers or over some number field, like the rationals, or maybe you, you know, adjoin some roots of unity or something like that. Um, and so it's, you know, from that perspective, it's not so surprising you can do this to say, well, in, in each case, we're interested in solving polynomial equations, um, but, you know, we might be over a different field. On the other hand, you know, when I learned that you could do this, that this was a subject, it was really quite astonishing. I mean, because you know, in algebraic geometry, we're doing something that's very, you know, geometric. We have something, you know, something like a manifold, some space we're moving around in. Whereas in number theory, it seems like the things you're looking at are very discrete. Like the, the points are isolated from each other, and it's hard from a geometric perspective to see what they have to do with each other. Nonetheless, this is a very, um, you know, it's been a very like uh, impressive and profitable, and you know, there's a lot of ongoing research in this area. Um, so, like I mentioned last time, our uh, eventual goal for you know a series of lectures is going to be find all integer solutions to x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed equals t cubed. So find all the cubes that are a sum of uh, three cubes. And yeah, so I was inspired because I saw this, you know, someone asked this question on Twitter, what are all the solutions? And, you know, I realized, well, this is a, this is a great opportunity to showcase what algebraic geometry can do for you in a problem that seems unrelated. Uh, I did some digging and uh, apparently the, I think, the first solution to this problem, I think, is due to Euler. Um, but, you know, the, it's one of those problems that has a lot of history to it, and so there's lots of names attached to this. And, of course, there's the, uh, the really famous story about Harmy and Ramanujan, um, where I think it's Ramanujan's in the hospital, and uh, Hardy takes a cab and to visit him, and he says, well, you know, the number in the cab was completely unremarkable in 1729, and immediately Ramanujan is just like, well, it's... Uh, that's the first positive integer that can be written as the sum of two different cubes in two different ways. Or, you know, two non-trivial cubes in two different ways. You know, namely, 1729 is equal to uh, uh, 12 cubed plus 1 cubed, and it's also equal to 10 cubed plus 9 cubed. Um, and so, you know, you can see this as a solution to that if you're thinking about the integers and allowing negative numbers. So in particular, you get a solution like 10 cubed plus 12 cubed plus negative 10 cubed plus 1 cubed equals 9 cubed. So if we find all the solutions to this, we're also going to find all the numbers that have this property of being written as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. OK, so you know, uh, before I get into that, I want to just say a little bit about the, like the broad relationship between um, Birational geometry and uh, number theory. So specifically, what birational geometry tells us about what's going on here, and so, and I want to kind of introduce some of the the you know the big results and big conjectures of this area. So, as we talked about in the minimal model program, there's a kind of tripartite classification of algebraic varieties. And you know, you might have a variety that, that kind of dips into both, but the idea is you can kind of find a vibration where it's like 
you know, has one property in one direction and another in the other. So the, the, th the broad three types of algebraic varieties. So we have, we have minus, so we'll have that uh, the canonical divisor is positive. And then, you know, for curves, You know, let me write the uh, arithmetic properties. So for curves, when kx, when uh, minus kx is positive, we have that the genus is zero, so this is a p1. We have that kx is trivial, this is the Calabi-Yau case. This is for curves, we have genus one. And then we can have that kx itself is positive. This is the general type case, and this is g equals two. Um, yeah, so, you know, because I'm solving this problem and I think there may be kind of separate interest in this video, I'm just going to mention that if you haven't been following the rest of the course, you can just think of the, you can, you can roughly think of this in terms of like the degree of the equation, that as the degree of the equation goes up, you go further down the chart. Um, now for, for curves, so for the arithmetic of curves, the arithmetic of a genus zero curve is very simple in that Either a genus zero curve is isomorphic to P1, or it has no points. And the reason for this is that if you have a point, you can, you can use that to get a, a degree one divisor on your curve. And since it's genus zero, you can just move that around. That gives you, you know, you can use that to get a rational function, which will then map you isomorphically to P1 over the field of interest. So if you're working over the rationals and you have a rational point, then your curve is isomorphic to P1. And so you're either, so either lots of points because we're isomorphic to P1 or no points. And I generally think of this, this case as being, you know, even if you have no points, then you can always make a point happen by changing the field a little bit by taking a small extension, you know, I mean, or just taking a finite extension at least. Um, and, th and so then it's like, well, okay, you know, I can understand the problem by just thinking over that extension, then I'm isomorphic to P1, and then the Galois group of that extension will act on the, po rat on the points of my P1, and then I can kind of understand whether there are solutions or not from that action. Okay, so here, uh, so let's see here. So for K trivial, in general, this is supposed to be like the, the least understood case because it's right at the boundary. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of conjectures about this case that I don't really want to get into. In the case of curves, a genus one curve, if it has a point, is an elliptic curve. So this could have no points and it's just, you know, a genus one curve without any points. But uh, if there are points, you know, if they exist, form a finite rank abelian group. So, you know, the, the rational points of an elliptic curve over any field form a group, assuming there are any. Well, if it's an elliptic curve, you have at least one point. So, you know, so the rational points of a genus one curve, if you pick one of those points, you get the structure of a group, and it's finitely generated, uh, so finite rank abelian group. Uh, you know, the more general, you know, in higher dimensions, you don't always have this group structure because you could have like a K3 surface. And then, you know, there's a, lots of research ongoing about like how many rational points are on your K3 surface. This is kind of the middle case, so it's kind of the hardest one. And then for this one, there's always only finitely many points. So this is uh, finite many points over our field. Um, so that's, this is a theorem I think first proved by faultings. Uh, I forget what this, this is originally like the Mordell conjecture, I think, but uh, you, you hear this referred to as faultings theorem. Uh, there's also a proof due to Voida. I think that one was later. Um, and yeah, I think those are the two names that get associated with this. 
And yeah, I mean, this is just like a really remarkable theorem here. And the conjecture is that this extends into higher dimensions, this, this classification. So in particular, if you have a variety that's of general type, you expect that, well, you can't say there are finitely many points anymore, because you might have like a line with a bunch of points on it. But you expect that the, uh, the points themselves are not Zariski dense. So there's some other equation that isn't satisfied by all the points, but is satisfied by all the rational points over your field. This is an open conjecture. Um, so this is like Lang's conjecture. There are various like versions of this, but um, you know, so you can kind of, you know, depending on like how you dress up your variety and how you think about your points and all that, you know, if you if you incorporate like the theory of heights, which is one of the tools that gets that can be used in this proof, um, then you know you can get some sharper conjectures. But uh, you know, this is an open problem and. I think we don't even know how to do this for like high degree surfaces in P3. Okay, so that brings me back to this equation here. So where does that go on this chart? Well, it goes right here where minus kx is positive because this is a cubic surface. In P3. And so birational geometry tells us that at least over the complex numbers, this surface is isomorphic to the blow up at six points of G2. And if we can make this, this correspondence happen over, our, over the field we want to work on, the field of definition, in this case, the rational numbers, then we can understand the solutions of this from the points of P2, which we know what all the points of P2 are, it's just, you know, triples, you know, up to scale. Okay, so to kind of illustrate how birational geometry, you know, having a, having a map like this is going to help us find solutions, let me just do kind of the, the simplest example, which uses algebraic geometry to classify all the Pythagorean triples. So you can think of this as, you know, this is a cubic, uh, sorry, a, uh, a quadric curve in A2. It's such confusing terminology, you know, because like, you know, quad, sounds, you know, sounds like degree four, but you know, it's kind of a historical artifact, right? Um, yeah, so I mean, I could really write this as x squared plus y squared equals z squared if I wanted to think of it as, you know, something in projective space, you know, and you can kind of think about it either way. Um, but the key point is that it's very easy to find one solution if you just say, well, if I let x equal 1 and y equal 0, or let y equal 1 and x equal 0, then I can just find a solution, right? I have this point 0, 1, and it's on the circle. And the amazing thing is this helps us find all the other points. And the thing we do is we just do stereographic projections. The idea is that if you have a, you know, if you have a conic in the plane and a point on it, then the way you realize that your conic is rational over the field is you just project away from that conic. Because what you have is you have, this is embedded by, you know, a degree two divisor. And then when you project away, you're subtracting away one of the points. And so now you have it embedded by a degree one divisor. So you will just do stereographic projection, and I can just imagine that I have, you know, the line, uh, you know, here y equals minus one, and then I can say, well, here is a point on the circle, x y, and then I get a point here, which I'll just call t minus one. Okay, and so then I want uh, the condition that 
0, 1, x, y, and t minus 1 are all collinear, or I can just you know, directly compute uh, t in terms of x and y, but I'm what I'm really interested in is what is x and y in terms of t. So you know, here I have x, y, where x squared plus y squared equals 1, and then I have t minus 1. So you know, you can solve these equations in various ways, but the idea is that if I, you know, if I intersect this line with the circle, then restricted to the line, I get a degree two equation, and one of the roots is rational, so the other one's going to be rational as well. So okay. So line we have like you know you can think of this y equals mx plus b. You know do it the old-fashioned way, and then we say, okay, well, I have my, uh, or, I am going to have a vertical line, so let's say we have ax plus by equals c, um, and so I want 0, 1 to be on the, on the line, so then I have to have that b is equal to c, alright, so then I have ax plus by equals b, and now I'm plugging in, I have t minus 1 is in there too, so then I have at minus b equals b, so then I have t equals 2b over a, or, yeah, and so then I can say, well, let's just say, um, let's see, the one yeah, so the one line I want to avoid is the, you know, the line in infinity when t is, in, is infinite is the, is the one like this. So I can assume that uh, a is non-zero. So let's set a equal to 1. And then the line I get is uh, x plus, um, yeah, so then I get... Uh, x plus t over 2y is equal to t over 2. And now I just want to go back and solve for x and y in terms of t when x squared plus y squared equals 1. Okay, so, so now I have x is equal to t over 2 times 1 minus y. So the next squared is equal to uh, t squared over 4 times 1 minus 2y plus y squared. Okay, and then now, let's see, so... Um, right, and so now I want to use the fact that... Uh, so now I want to use the fact that x squared plus y squared equals 1. So now I have 1 minus y squared is equal to t squared over 4 times 1 minus 2y plus y squared. Hopefully I did this one correctly. So 1 minus y squared. So now I can just factor out the 1 minus y. So here, yeah, here's the idea here. So now I have 1 minus y times 1 plus y is equal to t squared over 4 times 1 minus y times 1 minus y. And then, you know, the point we projected from was where y equals 1. So I can assume y is not 1. Cancel off these. And so then I get uh, uh, 1 plus y is equal to t squared over 4 times 1 minus y. And now it's a matter of solving for y. So I get that uh, uh, y plus t squared over 4y um, is equal to So then I get t squared over 4 
minus one. And yeah, and then I say, all right, so then I get uh, y equals p squared over four minus one over p squared um, over four plus one. Um, and you know, if I, you know, this, this kind of, this four is kind of annoying. So, you know, if I just reparameterize, uh, you know, s equals two over two, then I get y is equal to s squared minus one over s squared plus one. Okay, and then, you know, from here you can just see, well, um, you know, x, yeah, so, so the idea is that if I take y squared, this is going to be s to the fourth minus two s squared plus one over s to the fourth plus two uh, s squared plus one. And then x squared should be one minus this. So then I can take x is equal to, well, plus or minus, but you know, the difference here is that I have four s squared. And if I take the square root of that, well, one of the square roots is two s over s squared plus one. Okay, and then if you take any s and you plug it in, you're gonna get a Pythagorean triple. And the discussion before shows this gets you all of them. So let's just plug in some numbers. Uh, anyone want to give me a number for s? Like an integer? Mm. Yeah, okay, let's do 3. Um, so for s equals 3, then y is going to equal 8 over 10. And then uh, x is going to equal 6 over, uh, over 10. So that gives us, you know, what we're looking for, which is, uh, yeah, so that'll give us uh, four fifths and three fifths. Yeah, it's a little strange, but I think I'm gonna get, oh, I see. And then, you know, if you do two, you get them in the other order. That's, that's why it's showing up twice. <laughs> Um, yeah, so then this is, you know, gives you the 3, 4, 5 triangle. Um, you know, if I try, say, s equals 4, okay, then y is going to equal, uh, on the bottom I have 17, on the top I should have 15, and then for x I have uh, 8 over 17, and, you know, I I'm not going to try and confirm this in my head, but you know, it seems reasonable that 8, uh, 15, 17 is a right triangle. Yeah, so you know, this gets you, you know, and so this was, you know, this has been known for thousands of years, maybe not using this picture, but, or maybe so, I don't know, but you know, you know, one way or another, people uh, in various places, I, I believe this is, this was certainly known in, uh, you know, to the ancient Babylonians and uh, in ancient China and probably many other places um, that, you know, you can get all the Pythagorean triples this way. Okay, so, so taking a step back, what we did here is we found a way to turn our variety into projective space over the field we were trying to work over and uh, and then we could use that to get actual equations for the map. And then because they're polynomial equations, if you plug rational numbers into a polynomial, you get rational numbers out. So that's how this technique works for finding rational points on your space. Okay, so, so I have like uh, a little over 20 minutes left. Um, which is, you know, not going to be enough time to, to do the whole calculation for uh, the, the problem we started with. So let me just kind of give like a, an overview of how we're going to proceed. So, So the result we're going to use is that any cubic surface over an algebraically closed field, so if we have x in P3, Q3, 
cubic surface, then we can think of x as being obtained by blowing up six points on T2. And the way that we see this, the kind of the telltale thing about the cubic surface that helps us realize this is the fact that there are 27 lines on the cubic surface. So inside x we have 27 lines. Okay, so these were special from the perspective of birational geometry because they're the minus one curves. So those are the curves that you can contract um, and end up with a, uh, still a smooth surface after contracting them. Um, and the idea is, well, si you know, six of these just come from the pre-images of the points. So we have six are, you know, the E1 up through E6, the exceptional divisors coming from this blow up. We have, uh, let's see, so then we have six choose two is 15, which are lines, strict transforms of lines through two of the points. L minus EI minus EJ. And then we have six, which are conics through uh, five points. So you just choose the point that you leave out and you get a conic and then it's strict transform in X is going to be a line. And I, you know, and I want to emphasize this is like literally a line in three-dimensional space. So it's like literally given by two linear equations. <clears throat> okay, so the challenge is going to be, okay, if I just can you a cubic surface, how do you find equations for, well, not just the six points, but for the, the rational map back to P3. So, you know, you know, the way you can view X is that X is the closure of, you know, I have some rational map from P2 to P3. And, you know, we know that this surface is anti-canonically embedded, so it's embedded by cubics to the six points. There's a four-dimensional space of these. And so you have, you know, cubic one up to cubic four. But how do you find the equations of these? So uh, the technique I want to use is I want to exploit uh, something I learned from a paper of Beauville, which is how to express this cubic surface as a determinantal variety. So what I mean by that, so, that, so what we're going to do so um, I guess I'll call this our tactic, is going to be express uh, the equation for x as, you know, so let's say x is the vanishing of the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix of linear forms. Okay, so it's not immediately clear why this is helpful, um, but you know it'll all be kind of revealed in due time. Um, so, and the other thing that's not clear of is like how you use this, or like how you produce this, given uh, such a. So, so yeah. So the two things are kind of like why is this helpful, and how do you even get such such a thing? Well, so this is where the uh, the result from Beauville comes in. So, so the result from Beauville is that if you can find a, a linear series of twisted cubics on X, so you know, and that you can think of as, you know, if you think of the Picard group of X, so you know, you have pick X, it's generated by L, which is like the, the pull, you know, this is not the hyperplane section, but it's the pullback of the line from the P2, and then E1 through E6, um, it's generated by all of these. So we just do Z, well, we'll just angle brackets like that. Um, you know, this L gives you the map back down to P2, and if you look at what that linear series is in P3, those lines all have degree three because you intersect with a hyperplane section, you get three points. So this is going to be a bunch of twisted cubics. So we take L, 
linear series of twisted cubics on x, and then we resolve the sheaf corresponding to L. Now, the reason this is going to work is because L has certain nice cohomological properties. Basically, that it doesn't have any cohomology vanishing, that it's non-vanishing in the middle, and that, you know, you know, basic, basically, like, the cohomology looks like the cohomology of projective space. In this case, just because you're mapping projective space using this. Um, and so, you know, you have an exact sequence like this, and if you resolve this guy, you get, uh, you know, maybe there's a, I think you don't even have to twist here, but then the idea is you get, there's three generators, and then, you know, the regular generator is among the ideal of a twisted cubic. There should be one relation among the generators, we call those syzygies. Um, but since we're restricted to being on X, then there's actually going to be three syzygies. And then it's in degree minus one. So the idea is that these are these these relations among the uh, the twisted cubics that live on X in this particular family, they are, there's three of them, and they're all linear. So this is a three by three matrix of linear forms, this map. So this is our M. And then it turns out that, you know, it's not so hard to convince yourself that the determinant of M, so because, you know, it's just like, well, you know, um, yeah, so, it turns out that if you take the determinant of M, that's exactly it gives you the vanishing that exactly gives you X. So then the determinant of M is an equation for X. Okay, so, so this is going to be the idea. And the great thing about this is that it works over any field with some caveat. So the caveat, of course, is that you know, your L here has to be defined over the field that you want. So you just take an arbitrary complex cubic surface, you may, may not be able to find this because you may not be able to have a birational map P2 that's defined over the field that you want. So the way that you find such a thing is you have to go back and look at these lines and make sure you have six non-intersecting lines such that the union of those lines, not necessarily the individual lines themselves, but the union of those lines is defined over the ground field. So what we're gonna see in our case is that you, know, you look at all the lines, and we will be able to find six such lines, um, but they themselves won't be, uh, you know, they won't be isomorphic to P1 over Q, it'll just be that the equation defining all six will be uh, defined over Q. Okay, so before I, uh, yeah, so let's see, what do I want to talk about first? Um, so we can talk about the six lines, or we can talk about how do you go from this equation to getting the thing that we wanted, which was the set of cubics. Well, here's like the really remarkable thing. I learned this from my advisor, David Eisenbud, a long time ago. And he's someone who's always very interested in syzygies and determinantal varieties. So the idea is you have your matrix M, and then this is a three by three matrix, you know, this is a, you know L1, L2, L3, these are all linear forms in X, Y, Z and T, these are the variables they use. Okay, and so the idea is that the, the place where this matrix has rank two, that's our, those are, that gives us our X. And then you can kind of just by squinting at this be like, okay, well, how do I get a point in P2 out of this matrix? Well, it's a three by three matrix. And so if it has rank two, that means that there's a one dimensional space, subspace of 
three-dimensional space, which gives us the kernel. So the, the kernel vector, you know, if I have this ABC equals zero, then that sends a point, a point in X to P2. And moreover, you can check that, you know, as you change as you change x, y, z, and t, then a, b, and c, you know, they change as well. So this really does give you a rational map to p2, and in fact, it's the it's the one you're looking for. Okay. And so, so the tricky thing now is to say, okay, so I want to think about this m as like a bigger object. So right now, m is like a three by three matrix. So it's in, you know, the tensor product of two vector spaces. It's like, you know, a three-dimensional vector space and it's dual. But the fact that it's in linear forms, you can actually think, well, it's actually the tensor product of three vector spaces. So the input space, the out, you know, the dual, let's see, sorry, the output space, the dual of the input space, and the space generated by x, y, z, and t. So the idea is we think of M as belonging to you know, V tensor, W tensor, U, where this is like three-dimensional, three-dimensional, and four-dimensional. And then we just switch which two are giving us the matrix and which one is giving us, you know, the polynomial. So this matrix, we can, by flipping things around, we can think of it as instead of a three-by-three three matrix in linear forms and four variables, we can turn it into a four-by-three matrix with linear forms in three variables. Okay, so that's, you know, this kind of blew my mind when I first saw it. And it still kind of blows my mind to this day. But this actually works. And what it does for you is that if I turn M into this four by three matrix, then the minors of that matrix give me the cubics defining the map from P2 to X. Okay. So then what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, so we rewrite M as a 4 by 3, or 3 by 4, I always get these mixed up. Uh, you know, we have L1 prime and ABC, L2 prime and ABC, L3 prime and ABC, and L4 prime and ABC. I guess I should call this M prime. And then, and then the idea is that, well, you know, each ABC should get sent to the matrix which, you know, annihilates it. Where, so the matrix such that, you know, this tensor has dropped in rank. So the idea is that to get the XYZ out of the ABC, you should just check where, it, which values of, you should just check where the rank drops here. And so the rank dropping, corresponds to where all the three three by three minors vanish. And so the idea is that the three by three minors of M prime give the four cubics defining the rational map from P2 to uh, Okay, and you know, so one of the ways to see this is if you look at uh, if you look at the geometry of syzygies. So this is uh, um, you know, so this is an example in that book. Is that you can also or another way to think about this matrix is that it's uh, the matrix of syzygies for the equations defining the ideal of the six points you're blowing up. And so that's, you know, and so that's like the kind of the third viewpoint on this tensor because you can kind of, you know, you can swap it around and you can turn it into a matrix of linear forms in like three different ways depending on which of these vector spaces you pick to be the odd man out. Yeah, so I really like this trick that, you know, because it, it's also kind of gives you a way to like think about tensor products of three different vector spaces. So it's like if you have a tensor product of two vector spaces, like a matrix, you have a tensor product of three vector spaces, it's like a matrix of linear forms. 
And then, you know, for four, well, I don't know. I guess it's like a matrix of linear forms parameterized by linear forms. It's getting like a little too complicated. You know, maybe it's like a matrix of matrices. It's hard to say. Um, but using this, you know, so using this, you can go from the determinal, determinantal representation of the cubic you start with to a determinantal representation of the, uh, uh, the equations that define the rational map from P2 to your variety. Okay, so, so this is what we're going to use next time. Um, so let me just say a little bit about our specific case here. So it turns out it's actually pretty easy to just write down a determinantal representation of, uh, of our variety x, except it's going to be over the wrong field. So the issue is going to be how to like, you know, how to be a little more judicious about the choices we make so that we get something over the correct field. So here's the idea, is that, you know, if I rewrite my x as uh, x cubed minus y cubed plus z cubed minus t cubed, which my equation for x, and so now, you know, I've changed it slightly so that instead of, you know, I just swapped y for minus y because I kind of prefer having, uh, you know, this alternating sign business. Um, I guess it would probably be even better if I just made them all plus, but it's like, I don't know. I kind of, I kind of like having x equal to y instead of x equal to minus y. Um, so here, you could just note that, well, this factorizes into three linear forms and this factorizes into three linear forms, and so you can just write the determinant of x minus y, z minus t, zero, zero, x minus uh, omega y, z minus omega t, uh, and then the last zero has to go here, and then this would be z minus omega squared t, x minus omega squared t, and this is where, you know, omega equals, uh, you know, it's a third root of unity. And, you know, this is great, except for the fact that it's over the wrong field. You know, so here, we have this determinantal representation that works over the field, you know, the field Q join omega. So this is a cyclotomic field. Um, and, you know, when I first, you know, was doing this and trying to figure out, like, what are these formulas, um, this is, you know, I did all this procedure and then came up with this determinantal representation and I was like, oh, right, well, I guess I could have just written this down. But, you know, the nice thing about going through that technique is that it'll let us find a way to choose our determinantal representation a little bit differently and be able to get it so that I can get rid of these omegas. That last one's omega squared y, right? Uh, yes. Yes, in fact it is. Okay, so, yeah, so any questions? So you want to change the matrix to get rid of the omegas? Yeah, but this one you won't be able to do it because the things that are, because the, the idea is that we're blowing down six lines. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is that the Galois action, you know, so here the Galois group is Z mod two because you can just replace omega with omega squared. And so if I can find six lines that are disjoint and the Galois action sends them like this, or maybe, you know, it fixes two of them or something, but it turns out, I think, I think the only way you can do this is like this, then, you know, then we'll be able to write this matrix as over Q. But in fact, for this one, the things that you blow down are not conjugate to each other. Like, it's not self-conjugate, so in fact, this scheme of the six lines for this matrix is not defined over Q. So this one was easy to write down, but unfortunately it's the wrong one for getting the solutions over the, the rational numbers. So we have to kind of do a deep dive and look at the geometry of all the lines on this guy to, uh, um, to, to really be able to write down this matrix and make it work over, to make it be over the rationals. Uh, do I understand correctly that like on this on this uh, equation you wrote, there are like honest uh, lines? 
Ooh. Well, here's the thing. Yeah, they're honest lines over the, like, so, so let me tell you what all the lines are. These are actually really easy to find. Yes. Um, the idea is you can just say, well, um, let's see, so if you just take, you know, x minus y, uh, yes, yeah, so you have x cubed minus y cubed plus z cubed minus t cubed. And like, so, so here's how to find like one line. You can just take x equals y and z equals t. Right, that gets you one line. And then, you know, and, but I could have instead, you know, stuck it in a root of unity here or here. Or I can group the terms differently. And then if you go through and you count, that actually gets you all 27 lines. Yeah, but they're not defined over Q. Right? No, but so three of them will be defined over Q. But it's okay if your lines are not defined over Q as long as they come in conjugate pairs. So the issue, though, is that you have to actually find six lines in conjugate pairs that don't intersect. Because if you take, you know, if you just, you know, do this, then these two lines are conjugate, but you can't use them because they intersect. So they intersect when x and y are both 0 and then z equals t equals 1. So you can't use these two. Um, and so, you know, and that's going to rule out using even this individual line because they have to come in conjugate pairs. So the thing we're going to have to do first is we're going to have to find six lines. You know, so so in fact, what we're going to do is we're actually going to find a degenerate member of the the twisted cubic family, but it's like equivalent to finding the six lines. Um, so once you find the six lines, you can also find uh, a twisted cubic that's just you know three lines together like this where one of the lines is a God's honest line over Q, and the other two are conjugate to each other. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next time.